this is the write-up for quiz one on Buckingham's theorem and dimensional analysis. So Buckingham's theorem pretty much just says that if you have a given physical system, there are m physical variables like density, speed, gravity, and length defined in terms of n independent physical um, quantities or fundamental units. So that's like mass, length, and time. And then you can describe that system with m minus n independent dimensionless groups or pi groups. Um, and then a corollary to that is if you have p pi groups, then you can express one of the dimensionless groups as a function of the other. So pi p is a function of pi 1, pi 2, and all the way up to pi p minus 1. If you only have one pi group, then that single dimensionless parameter is, must be a constant. So for the quiz, we had to use Buckingham's pi theorem to show how the lift force is governed by the given variables. So these are all the given variables. We have the aspect ratio, the angle of attack, and all these other ones. So we listed the terms here, expressed the variables and fundamental units here. So we have the physical variable and then the fundamental units below them. We have three fundamental units and seven variables. So we have four pi terms. Um, the repeating variables will be the density, velocity, and area. We wanted the lift force to appear definitely in this one because we want each one to be in at least one pi group. So then we put it in terms of the fundamental units assigned A, B, and C to the various repeating variables, and then mass, we count the terms. So we have one A, one plus A, on the left side we have zero. For the length, for the L's, which is the length, we have one, negative three A, B, and two C, and then for T, which would be time, we have negative two minus B, zero. If you solve for all those, you get negative one, negative two, and negative one again. And our pi one group is the lift force divided by density, velocity squared, um, times the area. For this next pi 2 group, we wanted the dynamic viscosity to appear. So we kept the same repeating variables and repeated the same process, solving for the um, variables down here. We ended up with pi 2 is equal to the dynamic viscosity divided by the density times the velocity times the square root of the area, which is 1 over the Reynolds number. And then our other two pi groups are already done for us. It is the angle of attack, which is dimensionless. And then the aspect ratio is also dimensionless. Using the corollary, we know that pi 1 is a function of pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4. So we can just say um, that the lift force, which is pi 1, is equal to the di dynamic uh, viscosity, not the dynamic viscosity, the density, times velocity squared, times the area, times the function of the other three uh, pi groups. Next, we had to use um, kinematic similarity. So for kinematic similarity, the Reynolds number of the prototype has to equal the Reynolds number of the model. They have to be proportional. So air would be um, the prototype and water would be the model. So we just set the two um, pi groups that we found equal to each other for the Reynolds number. And we just solve for the velocity of the water because these are constants, these are given, these are given, and then these were also given. Next, for dynamic similarity, we use pi group one for air and pi group one for water. Once again, set them equal to each other. We can solve for LW over LA, which is what we're looking for. That's the lift forces between the two, so for water and air. And then these are all given, these are all given, and these, this was given as well for the relationship of the areas. That was question one. Question two involves an air jet discharging vertically and pushing a ball up. The height is a function of these other physical variables. So once again, we pretty much just follow the same uh, procedure. We have the physical variables here, fundamental units here. We have seven and three, so four pi groups. The repeating um, terms will be D, V, and rho. So we just keep on going. So the first question to ask for the non-dimensional parameters that characterize this, so it's just the pi groups. So pi one, um, we use H because we want that to appear, and then we have our repeating variables here, A, B, and C. We solve for the M, L, and T terms solve for A, B, C, and we just end up with H over D. We also could have just recognized that H and D have the same L's for their fundamental units, and we could have just done that ourselves. Similar thing for pi two. Didn't need to do all this, but um, it shows the process. Pi three, we wanted the uh, mu to appear. So we have that here, and um, we do the same thing. So we have the repeating variables, M, L, and T, A, B, A, C, and B. Uh, pi 3 is equal to that, which is equal to 1 over the Reynolds number, and then pi 4, we do the same thing. We wanted the W, which is the weight of the ball, to appear because it's the only one that we have left that we haven't shown. So we do the same process, and we end up with pi 4 is like that.
Moving on to part B here, we want to know what happens if the diameter of the ball D is doubled. How would the height, diameter of the hole, and the weight of the ball change to maintain dynamic similarity? So first we just start off with pi group 1 and compare them to each other for the prototype and the model. So pi group 1 was this HP over DP, HM over DM, and we could see that the um, height would double. And then down here we wanted to see how the weight would change. So we know already that the height would double, so then down here by using pi group 3 we prove that the velocity would get halved. So the velocity would be halved, but the um, diameter would be doubled, so that would cancel out, and we would end up with that the weight would stay the same. So the weight is not affected if the diameter of the ball is doubled. And then down here, we want to figure out what would happen to the diameter of the holes. So we use similar to up here for pi group 1, our pi group 2 uh, for d over d, d over d, and we would just see the diameter doubles. And that is uh, quiz 1 for, on Buckingham's theorem. This is quiz two on hydrostatics and pressure. So first we wanted to figure out the pressure difference between point A and point B, um, given these things, and we also had to supply the density of water. So pretty much just to figure out the pressure at B from A, we have to figure out the pressure at each interface using this formula. So pressure is equal to P naught plus rho G D, which is the dis vertical distance between the two. So we started off with PC, which is equal to PA plus the density of water, which is this fluid here times gravity times D1. PD would be PC minus this because it's higher up, so it has less pressure there. PE would be PD plus this, which is the density of fluid here. We have to be careful to make sure that the fluid um, density that we're using is correct for each one. And then once we have PD, we can move to PE, move to PF, and move to PB. Um, and then from these, we can just cancel it all out and find PB in terms of PA in the given dimensions. So if we add these all together, using PA and then PC becomes that, PD becomes that, we get this, and then if we subtract PA, we get this down here, and that's our answer for question one. Um, it is just a matter of working through it methodically. Now we have to figure out the force required to hold this gate closed, assuming that PB is equal to PATM. Um, and then also we have to figure out how would the force change if PB was equal to double PATM. So in the beginning here, when PB is equal to PATM, the forces of these cancel, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so now we just have to find the force required to hold the gate would be equal to the hydrostatic pressure acting on here. So here is a diagram showing how the pressure would increase going down the gate and how the force would have to be bigger, um, how the force has to account for that. Due to Pascal's law, the pressure is equal in all directions, so it doesn't matter if it's pointing this way or this way or this way or this way, it's going to be forcing, forcing on it. Pressure from the water would be equal to the pressure, sorry, the force from the water is equal to the pressure there times the area. So we set up our axes like this, X and Y, so that's just easier. We don't have to worry about the um, dealing with all the angles and everything. So the force from the water is equal to the pressure times dA, so we have to figure out what our pressure um, formula will be. Um, this is angle here is going to be 60 since this was 30. So the cosine of 60, so this would be one half, whatever y is here. And we only worry about the vertical distance. So then, um, and we also have to account for the depth that it already starts at underwater. So the pressure would be equal to g times rho times d plus one half y. So the force from the water would be pressure times area. The moment from the um, water would have to be the force times the distance from it. So we have to add in another y term. So then we have to integrate also with another y. And then the moment from the force would be in the opposite direction um, assuming a positive direction is this way, the force would be acting in the negative direction, LF in the opposite direction. So we set up our moments down here. We have minus LF, DA is W, which is the given width into the page, times DY. So then LF would be equal to this integral. We substitute in our formula for PH over here, and then we see here, um, do the integral down here all the way, divide by L on both sides, um, and the integral goes from zero to the whole length of it since we accounted for um, the angle here so we can integrate over this whole distance here. We end up with our force is equal to this here acting in direction shown in the diagram. So it's acting onto the um, hinge like that. Next for B, how would it change if PB is equal to PATM? So if um, PB is equal to PATM, there's equivalent pressure acting on the other side of the gate. Um, but the moment still needs to cancel, so we have another force here, PATM, acting on this whole area. So then the force from PATM would just be, it acts in the middle since it's a uniform force. 
times LW, which is the area. So we have to add that into our moment equation. And then we do this, follow the same steps. Um, this would also be acting in the same direction as the force, so it's negative. And we end up with the force is equal to this um, minus this, because the force doesn't need to be as big because it has a PATM helping it. And that is quiz two. This is quiz three on Bernoulli's equation. Um, so we have to determine the volumetric flow rate Q and uh, determine the monometer reading H, provide all assumptions made. Uh, so that's just the assumptions for Bernoulli's equation. Um, in my quiz, I tried to make a streamline in the static portion, which you can't do. Um, so we'll start off with Bernoulli's equation, uh, which is given here along a streamline. Um, C is a constant or a chicken. So our assumptions are steady flow, incompressible fluid, and viscid, and that the equation is constant along a streamline. We're given these, and we want to find Q and H. So we start with using Bernoulli's equations between 1 and 4. 1, 4. Um, to find V4, to use that to find Q. So P1 is equal to P4 is equal to PATM, which is equal to 0. Um, since this is a free jet, this is a large reservoir. And also, since this is a large reservoir, we can say that V1 is equal, about equal to 0, since it's draining really slowly. So a streamline connects 1 to 4, so we can use Bernoulli's equation. Uh, we can go through that here, and we can end up with V4 here. Q4 is equal to A4 times V4. We know A4 from that, and we end up with Q4 like that. For B, finding H, we want to use Bernoulli's equation for 1 and 2 to find the pressure at 2. Um, and then we can use um, hydrostatics to get from 3 to 2. So uh, once again, P1 equal to PATM is equal to 0. V1 is about 0, assuming a large body. Um, same assumptions. Um, steady, inviscid, incompressible equation is constant. So we have the same assumptions. So then we set up between one and two like this. Our Q2 is equal to Q4 since it's the same Q, um, the steady flow. Uh, then we can use that to find the relationship between V2 and V4, and we know V4 from before. So then we use that, plug it all in to find P2. Now we can use hydrostatics from three to two. This is three, and this is two. We wanna find H. This is mercury, so we gotta use a different row for that. But our P3 is just minus the rho mercury times GH, some difference in H, plus the um, extra pressure from the water and Z2 is equal to P2. We set those equal to each other, and we can solve for H here, and that is quiz three, problem one. This is quiz three in fluid mechanics on Bernoulli's equation. So we have this um, large reservoir, and then the water is discharging through a pipe through an open gate and filling this one. And we also have um, this here measuring the um, height as well, and the diameter of the pipe gets smaller over here as well. So what we wanna know is what is H2 when the gate is closed? find V2, which is the velocity here in the narrow part, and Q3, which is the volumetric flow rate over here, and then find the minimum height H for the bubbler to work. So for the bubbler to work, you need H2, which is the height of this fluid here, to be the large diameter divided by two plus the small diameter divided by two. So if the tube, since this tube is open and this tube is open, they have the same pressures, so they have the same forces. So if this gauge is closed, the pressures are equal, the forces are equal, and H1 will equal H2. For question, for question B, we have to use Bernoulli's equation between one, points one and three. So in order to use Bernoulli's equation, we have to make some assumptions. We have to assume it's steady flow, incompressible, and viscid fluid, and that this equation is valid along streamline. The, um, as well, in addition to that, we have to know that P1 up here is equal to P3, since this is a free jet, which is equal to PATM, since we're dealing re relative pressures, this is zero, and it can cancel in the equation. We also know that V1 is about zero, because we're assuming it's a large reservoir and it's going very slowly. So we set up Bernoulli's equation here between points one and three. We can cancel P1, cancel P3, cancel this because V1 is zero. Do some math and we end up with what the velocity three is there. Once we have velocity at three, we know that the volumetric flow rate is going to be equal here and here since it's steady flow. So we can set up Q2 is equal to Q3, A2, V2 is equal to A3, V3. We know all of these. We just don't know V2, which is what we're looking for. We can plug in our V3. We can... Um, use the A's here, and we end up with what our V2 is here, and then we can use that to find Q2 by plugging it back in, and we end up with our answers for V2 and Q2, which was B. Now, for the next one, we have to use Bernoulli's equation between points one and two, which is point one and two for the bubbler to work. 
when H2 is uh, big D over two plus little D over two. So again, we have to state our assumptions um, that it's a large reservoir, so V1 is about zero. So now we set up Bernoulli's equation between point one and two. We can find the pressure difference between one and two is that. And so using Bernoulli's, we can find that this is all that. And from B, we can plug in our answer down here for V2. Which was here. And then there we go. And then we can also use hydrostatics. So from hydrostatics, we know that the pressure difference between here and here would just be rho times g times the difference in the height. We can set those equal to each other. We can set h2 for that. And then we can solve for this. And then we have this final um, condition for the, this. If this condition is satisfied for h1, then the bubbler will work. And that is quiz two. So now that we've finished with quiz three, we're on to quiz four, which is on Reynolds transport theorem. These are the relevant equations for relative velocity, conservation of mass, um, for Reynolds transport theorem, Reynolds transport theorem for the conservation of linear momentum. The Reynolds transport theorem in general is this, but in class we adapted it for the conservation of mass and conservation of linear momentum. Conservation of linear momentum is also equal to the sum of the forces acting on it. So here is the problem. We have a uh, tube, um, or uh, it's two plates in place with a plug in the middle of it. We know all these parameters, we know these parameters. So we want to calculate the exit velocity at U exit. So that's here in terms of U naught, H1 and D, which is there, which are all given. D is the diameter of the plug um, like this. And then we want to determine the pressure at the inlet area. So P X equals zero. Pressure at exit um, is equal to zero because it's a free jet. Provide all assumptions made, which probably means we're gonna need to use Bernoulli's equation. And then last but not least, we have to calculate the force F required to hold the plug in place. So we're probably gonna have to use the conservation of linear momentum here because that sums all the forces on it. So first step is to figure out what our control volume is. And we wanna use our conservation of mass equation because that's just the easiest one to do. So we're assuming steady state. So the first integral drops because the control volume is size is not changing. Since the size isn't changing, this derivative is gonna be zero and we're just left with the control surface. So we're left with this equation then. Uh, the area of the exit is just the H minus D, which is the diameter of the uh, plug times the width. So when we do this, we have the U exit acting in the positive X hat direction for its N hat, and then the U inlet is acting in the negative X hat direction for its inlet. We know these areas. We can calculate them like this. When we put it together, we get our U exit is equal to that. For B, we use Bernoulli's. So we have a streamline acting like this. We assume steady flow, inviscid, incompressible, equation constant along the streamline. Here's Bernoulli's equation. So we just start with Bernoulli's at x equals zero, which is here, and when x equals L, which is there. We know that the pressure there is zero, and we know that these z's are the same because our streamline is like this, so those drop as well. And then we can find our Px equals zero for doing all of that, for some extra math down here to get to that. Next, we wanna use Reynolds Transport Theorem of Conservation of Momentum to find the forces acting on it. So P exit, sorry. So um, we'll start with the force diagram. So we have the pressure at the exit times the area at the exit acting in this direction, the pressure at the inlet and the area at the inlet acting in this direction and the force holding it in as well. So once again, the controller volume is not changing so we can drop that term from it and we're just left with this is equal to this. PEAE -E can drop because the pressure at the exit is zero since it's a free jet at the end. And we can just assume, and then we once again go through the process. So we have a positive X hat at the exit, negative X hat at the inlet. And then we can solve for our FX through this entire process. And it's in the direction shown in the diagram, even though this is positive, so it's acting in the plug. Uh, it was negative up here, acting that way. For question two, we have another um, sandwich going on. And we have a different H1 and H2, V1 and V2 and we have it acting over here as well. And we wanna find the delta P in between P in and P out, given V1, V2, H1, and H2, and uh, the density, and we're not allowed to use Bernoulli's. And then once we find that, we wanna find, is the pressure at outlet higher or lower than inlet when V1 does not equal V2? So when this is present and this velocity has to be higher, what is the um, pressure difference? Is it higher here or is it higher here? So first we start with our control volume diagram. Uh, we can assume that the pressure is uniform from here to here and here to here. 
um, from x equals zero to x equal l, and we use conservation of mass, controlling volume isn't changing, that drops. So we're just, so we're just left with this. So we have um, at the inlet, we have h1 times v1, negative direction, v2 times h2, all times b, acting in negative direction. And then over here, we have h1 plus h2 for the total height, acting in the positive direction for its n hat. And then all the, all the b's drop, all the rows drop, and we're just left with this. And that gives us our v3, which will be this v up here. Next, we want to use conservation of momentum. So we have our P in, A out, P in, this is supposed to be P in, A in, and our P out, A out, although it's the same, it doesn't matter since it's acting pressure along the uniform, this areas are gonna be the same. Once again, we can have our control volume drop to zero since it's not changing in size. So we assume uniform pressure is acting on each side of the control volume, so these A's are gonna be the same. That's why this is the same and that's the same, but our P out is gonna be acting in the negative direction these P's are not the same, so we can't drop the terms. And then over here, we have our um, V1 acting in the negative direction, V2 acting in the negative direction, our V3 acting in the positive direction. We have our V3 from before, and then we can do a lot of math, plug in our V3, go through the um, integrals here, and we end up with P in minus P out is equal to this. So we have V1 minus V2 squared. So it doesn't matter if um, when V1 does not equal V2, P in minus P out is going to be greater. So it doesn't matter which is, due, which is larger due to the squared term, pressure at inlet it will always be higher if velocities are different. And that is our quiz four. This is quiz five on Reynolds transport theorem for angular momentum. So we have our relevant equations up here, conservation of math, conservation of linear momentum, conservation of angular momentum. The only difference, uh, not the only difference, but for conservation of angular momentum, um, they're equal to the sum of the torques and the conservation of linear momentum is equal to the sum of the forces. And then we also have the energy equation down here. So for our first one, we have a spinning jet here. So we define our axes like this and G like this and positive is in this direction. So we want to determine theta in terms of M naught, which is the mass of the pipe, uh, the length of the pipe, area, rho, and M dot and G. And then above what value of M dot will the pipe rotate without stopping is B. And then for, uh, oh, so sorry, there is no C. For, for A, the general idea is at constant angle of theta, um, the torque from the um, jet going this way is going to equal the torque from the mass um, pulling it down. And so then we can use that to find theta um, since the uh, torque from the mass is dependent on theta. So we start with the fluid. So we have steady state, the control volume is not changing in size, which is illustrated here. So that term drops again. And we just have this is equal to some of the torques. So the torque from the fluid is equal to this. This is equal to m dot and v is just equal to negative m dot over rho a because of how we chose it. The inlet term doesn't matter because it's perpendicular to the flow, so it cancels. So then we're left with this l times v times m dot. Our v is defined up here as m dot divided by rho times the area of the um, exit tube. So then we have negative m dot m dot l over rho a. So the gravity moment um, includes the weight of the fluid in the pipe. I didn't include the weight of the fluid in my, sorry, the uh, yeah, the weight of the fluid in my quiz, so I lost points for that. So F gravity is the M pipe plus M fluid times G, and R is L over two sine theta, since uh, you only care about the term, act about this distance here. Um, this distance uh, is not the true torque resulting from it and the true moment. So then we have the torque from gravity, which is this times R, so then we do this and we do this. So then T gravity plus T fluid is equal to zero. We have this and this minus that, set that equal to each other. We have sine theta is equal to this, and we have our theta is equal to the inverse sine of this over here. Next, when sine of theta is equal to that is no real solutions, that's when the pipe is gonna spin without stopping. So um, when this is greater than one, since sine of theta is between, um, is uh, can't be greater than one, um, so this has to be less than one. So if we do the math, we can find that when m dot is greater than the square root of this, that's when the pipe will spin without stopping when there's no real solutions. And that is question one. And now moving on to question two. So this uh, studies the results of a sudden expansion of a pipe like this and the um, effects on it. So first we have to find a dimension, dimensionless scaling law for delta P in terms of V, D, D2, P, sorry, not P, rho and mu. Um, and that's extra credit. And then also B is um, extra credit two. Simplify the result of A for a high Reynolds number, turbulent flow where mu doesn't matter. 
C is used control volume analysis to determine delta P in terms of V, D1, D2, and rho for high Reynolds number limit. And then D is determine the ideal flow value for delta P, so that's using Bernoulli's, so that's gonna be the ideal flow. And compare this to the result from C for a diameter ratio of D1 over D2 is equal to one half. So first we'll start off with our diagram like this. So we will also, so once again, just like quiz one, we wanna use Buckingham's theorem. So we have our physical variables here, the fundamental units here. We have six physical variables and three fundamental units, so three dimensionless groups. Rho, V, and D are gonna be repeating. So we have delta P because we want it to appear in pi one. We go through the same process, M, L, and T. We solve for A, C, B. And we end up with our pi one group is this. Our pi two group is easy. It's just D one over D two. And then our pi three group, we do the same process for rho V, D one, and we want mu to appear. So we have it there um, and we end up with this, which is also equal to one over the Reynolds number. By the Buckingham's um, corollary, we have pi one is equal to a function of pi two, pi three. So we have delta P over rho V squared is equal to a function of D1 over D2 and um, a function of the Reynolds number as well. Um, so then there we go. So, uh, so the next for B, at a high Reynolds number, the viscosity is not relevant. Um, so it drops. So then we just have it's a function of the um, differences in diameters. Now for two, um, continued, we have part C. So we want to use conservation of mass first. So it's a steady, steady state, control volume is not changing, so that drops. So then we just have A1, V1, the N hat is negative there, and then the N hat is positive for A2, V2 is that. So that's gonna be used later. Next, we wanna go into conservation of linear momentum to find the sum of the forces. This drops, steady, control volume isn't changing. Um, so the forces acting on it is we have P1, A1 acting up here, P2, A2 acting over here, but we also have P1 acting here and here. So this is gonna be A2 minus A1. So um, down here we have that um, illustrated and then also on the left side we have A1 V1 squared for the control surface changing and then A2 V2 squared for the control surface changing as well. This is a negative N hat, this is a positive N hat. Uh, this multiplies out and these cancel so we just end up with this. We sub in our A's, we sub in our V2 which we solve for using the um, conservation of mass over here. Um, as illustrated down here. Um, sorry, that wasn't using this. This was using um, the, sorry, yes, the conservation of mass. So then we use that, plug that into here, and uh, we go through the math and we find that the pressure difference using conservation linear momentum, conservation of mass, and using this sudden expansion of the pipe is equal to this. So then now we wanna find the ideal um, pressure to drop and compare it to the result from this one which we found using linear momentum. So um, this was the result from C, just wrote it again. So for Bernoulli's, we have to assume steady flow, incompressible, and viscid, and that this equation is a constant along the streamline. So first we, um, so if D1 over D2 is equal to one half, we plug that into our result from there, and we end up with this for, um, that's the result from C. And then we use um, one and two using this streamline uh, we know that this is from before, so we can go use this math all the way through, and we find out that they have the same um, main part, but the coefficients are different. So um, 6.30 seconds was for the uh, actual using linear momentum, and 15.30 seconds was for the Bernoulli's ideal. So we find that the sudden expansion only achieves 40% of the ideal pressure difference. Um, so uh, sudden expansion is bad for uh, efficiency purposes. And that is quiz five. This is quiz six on string functions and velocity potentials. So uh, we given extra credits. Um, this is also how you do those. Um, and we're given this problem as well. So A, the extra credit, we have to show the velocity potential and stream function for this flow are as follows. So the velocity potential is all this and the stream function is all that. B, we have to determine the location of the stagnation points denoted by S. So that's here and here. That's where the velocity is gonna be zero. And then what is the pressure distribution along the Y axis from the fluid? So for both ideal flow functions, there will be three terms. So there's a free stream here, the source here, and the sink there. So these are just from the um, reference sheet for the formulas. And then our R is gonna be X squared plus Y squared, the square root of that, but we need to shift it since it's not at the origin. So our R of the source is gonna be X plus A squared plus Y squared, and the R of the sink is X minus A squared plus Y squared. Um, the theta or angle is determined from the x-axis, so that's just the inverse tangent of y 
over um, x plus a or x minus a. And then we can just plug that into these formulas and we end up with the exact same thing that we're given in the problem statement. Um, that's the x credit. Next, for the stagnation points, we have velocity is equal to zero for u and v at the stagnation points. So first we wanna find our u and v terms. So we find that by doing the derivatives of these to get our um, u and v terms. So uh, we end up with v is equal to this and u is equal to this by taking the derivative of um, the potential with respect to x for the u and the derivative of the potential with respect to y for v. So then v here is zero when x equals zero, but also when y is equal to zero. u is zero only when y is equal to zero, and, um, but that's the only point. So the stagnation point can only occur at y equals zero because you need both of them to be zero. So then now you have u of x comma zero. Um, so now you wanna find the x component when y is equal to zero for the u term. So then we have, so we solve for that, do all this math, and we get that u to that x is equal to plus or minus this. So then the two stagnation points for, for that point there um, will be when u is equal to zero. So then we have um, the two stagnation points, x comma y will be plus or minus this on the uh, y, on the, sorry, on the x axis when y is equal to zero. Next, we wanna find the pressure distribution along the y-axis. So we know now from u comma v when x equal to zero that we have this. That was found before. Um, now we use Bernoulli's, so we need to state our assumptions again. Steady, incompressible, and viscid, and equation is constant along streamline. So found, this was found by setting x equal to zero using the above equations. So using these for x equals zero, we end up with this. Because remember, x equals zero is, um, makes v zero, but not um, u zero, so that's what happens here. Next, um, we assume the same h for the streamline that we're using, so those cancel, and we have the pressure of x comma y, and we're using our pressure from um, infinity away. So then we have our pressure at zero comma y here, minus the pressure of the infinity, so this is gonna be the pressure distribution. We move it around, we plug in our um, u and v here um, using this above, and we end up with the pressure distribution looking like this. Next, for two, I had to find the question. For two, for the following 2D stream potential functions, find the fluid velocity, u equals uv, draw the streamlines and determine whether those conserve mass. They conserve mass if du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. So these are our two functions. Psi is equal to a x squared plus y squared, and then phi is equal to a x squared plus y squared. So u is d psi dy, that's 2ay. V is negative d psi dx, that's negative 2ax. Mass is conserved if du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. That's true, so mass is conserved for that one. Following along, the streamlines are given by x squared plus y squared are constant. The gradient squared of the psi is 4a, and this is negative 4a, and the wz would be negative 4a, so the rotation rate is negative 2a about the z-axis, doesn't really ask for that. Um, so in assuming a positive a, the signs point to clockwise flow like this, so we have a circle flowing like this. Next, for the potential, we have phi is equal to a x squared plus y squared. So once again, we do u is equal to the phi dx, v is equal to phi dy, and now once again we use phi instead of psi. We find two ax and two ay. We see if they add up to zero, they don't add up to zero, so it does not conserve mass. Next we do dy dx to find the, um, what the streamlines are gonna look like. So dy dx is v over u, two ax over two ay is equal to y over x. We um, integrate these to figure out what um, the y is equal to x is look like. So we get ln y is equal to ln x plus constant, which is pretty much just y equals constant x. So that's straight lines, which means a uniform expansion in the xy plane. So it's gonna be looking out like that. And uh, that is quiz six. This is quiz seven on the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, so we start with an annulus channel. We assume gravitational effects are negligible and they're maintained by pressure gradient dp dz. So if we wanna determine the actual velocity as a function of radius r, which probably means that we're um, not gonna use Cartesian coordinates and then derive the shear stress distribution. The shear stress is equal to mu du dz, du z over dr with respect to r. And then we wanna find the radius at which the max velocity is reached. So the flow is gonna be in these channels here. We have a and b given here, z in this z direction and this r here. So we're gonna use cylindrical coordinates, like I said, um, in the z direction of Navier-Stokes equation. So we have the z equation here. 
we know that ur is going to be equal to zero and u theta is going to be equal to zero since it's only flowing in this direction. Since it's only flowing in this direction, um, and ur is equal to zero and u theta is equal to zero, we can use conservation of mass down here. Um, and we end up with duz, which is this term, dz is equal to zero. This is zero because it's steady. This is zero, this is zero, since vr and v theta are zero and they're not changing from zero. Once we go back over here, we can start canceling things in this equation. vr, like I said, is zero. v theta is equal to zero. Steady state, so this is zero. And this dvz over dz is also zero. This term isn't zero, but since this is zero, it cancels out. Then we're left with negative dp dz. Gravity is negligible, we're told in the problem, so that can go to zero. And then we're left with this stuff over here. This isn't going to be zero. This is what we're looking for. This is going to be the um, velocity function. This is going to be zero because it's not changing in theta. This is going to be zero because it's not changing in z. So now that we have that, we get rid of all those things. And we're left with this. The pdz is equal to this. We're going to integrate this twice because it has two derivatives. So we get mu over here. We integrate. We have this constant a. We integrate again. We have another constant b and a, l, and r. So we're left with this. Um, for our function of u. We're not done yet because we still need to find out a and b. Our boundary conditions are u equals zero at r equals a and b. Use that to find the constants a and b. So that means that um, we can assume um, that the velocity here and here are going to be zero because of no-slip boundary conditions. Um, so then now we have our two equations here. If we subtract them, the b's will cancel and we end up with our a. We can do a bunch of math and find that A ends up being this. Uh, in the solutions, they organize like this. I found it like that. It's the same thing. You just multiply the top and bottom by negative one. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what end up, ends up happening. Um, next, you have to um, find B. So now that you have A, you can plug that in for A. You can go through all the math, find out what um, B is, and B is this. You can plug in B, and you end up with this for your final equation down here if you uh, move things around, and uh, this is just the cleanest way to look at it. So that was um, question A. So this is the um, velocity, axial velocity uz as a function of r. So if you plug in this, uh, whatever your r is, you'll end up with your r's and with your, um, with your velocity. Next, we want to find the shear stress. The shear stress is just mu duz over dr. So from integrating before up here, when we were integrating, here it is. Um, when we first got it, this is equal to the same thing. So we can just plug that back in. We know what our A is now, so we can plug that in, and we just have our shear stress equal to this. Max velocity is reached when the shear stress is equal to zero, so we set this equal to zero, and we solve for our R. Next question has a cylinder and a cylinder. So we have our um, uh, so we have our cylinder falling like this. The fluid is flowing up, suspending it there. This is what the velocity distribution looks like like this. So we want to find W of Y, so how it changes with Y, and then find Q to hold the sta cylinder stationary, so to hold it in place in the um, sandwich. And uh, given we're also given this for the hint, and Q should only include mu, W, L, R, and H. So we go through a similar process as before. Um, these are our boundary conditions. So these are no-slip boundary conditions. So when Y equals zero, so we set up our axis two, so Z is up, Y is this way, this is H. So when Y is zero, which is here, it's gonna be um, zero velocity, and then when Y is H up here, it's gonna be zero velocity. You can see that in the distribution here. Um, it's not, the U and V velocities are zero, it's only flowing this way. So we also, once again, do conservation of mass, it's steady state, this is zero. These drop to zero, this drops to zero. DW, DZ is equal to zero. Now we plug it into the big equation. Um, we use Cartesian coordinates just because it's easier for this one. Um, so this U is equal to zero, V is equal to zero. This DW, DZ was proven over here to be zero. Steady state, this is zero. Gravity is negligible, that's zero. Um, it's not changing this direction, it's not changing that direction, that's zero, that's zero. So we're left with dp dz is equal to mu d squared w over dy squared. We do double integration again. We go through it all and we get a and b in our solution down here. We use our boundary conditions. When w when zero is plugged in, we get b is equal to zero. It makes our life easier. 
then we have w of y is equal to this. We gotta solve for a now, so when y is equal to h, w of h is equal to zero, no slip, zero. Um, we solve for a like that, and we end up with a w of y is equal to this. Same thing, the solutions had a uh, different um, organization of them, but they were equivalent anyway. So now we're given this value for w, uh, for that W in this case, I should have mentioned is for the weight, not the um, velocity. So this is the weight is equal to this. So we want to take our um, or my what I found for W of Y down here. And we want to take the derivative of that to plug it into there so that um, we can find the um, final expression for uh, Q. So now that we have that, uh, so we take the derivative of this, our DP DZ is just um, the pressure at the top minus pressure at the bottom over L. Um, so that's what we sub in for uh, these dp dz's. We sub that into there and we end up with this final um, function for the weight is equal to this. So now we go over here. So we have QAV, Q is equal to AV. Um, the center circumference, which is our, gonna be our area, is two pi R plus H over two. So that's H divided by two. Um, like that, that was the wrong thing. Um, so it's just the radius is just R plus H over two like that. And so we can find the flow rate by integrating the velocity over this whole H. H is this way. So we wanna find the velocity over the H from zero to H, W, Y, D, Y is the flow rate around it. So our W of Y, like, I, like we found before, is this. So we can go through some integrations and find that. DP, DZ, once again, is PB minus PT over L. We can go through that whole thing, plug this whole thing back into the equation for Q, and we get Q like that. Um, and then once we have this, we um, are left with this, which we're kind of stuck with. But we had already found that over here with W. Over here is equal to pi PB, P minus T. And then we can plug that into this down here and we end up with our equation for Q. This cancels um, when we assume that R is much greater than H. Um, so then we can uh, um, assume that this would cancel and this would cancel. So we are left with this equation for our final value of Q, which is what we wanted to hold the cylinder stationary. And that is quiz seven. This is the final exam question one. Um, so this is uh, question one is about fluid static. So we want to determine the gate force to um, keep the reservoir from spilling. So similar to what we did in the quiz, um, I, I messed this up because I did not do D minus Y sine theta, but so we have our axis like this, our Y is gonna go out like that. Um, and the solution is once again gonna be to keep the moment from the force applied must equal to the moment created by the pressure acting on the gate. So the pressure moment acting this way, you know, looking like this, is gonna equal the force from the gate moment acting that way. Um, so first we wanna find our equation for L, which is just equal to D over sine theta. And we also wanna find our equation for H of Y, which is D minus Y sine theta. So that's what your depth is gonna be. So if you're here at this Y, you're gonna have this much pressure acting on it. So um, Pascal's law, pressure acts in all directions similar to the quiz problem. So pressure is equal to um, rho g h of y, so force would be pressure times the area. The area is just w dy. So we find the force by integrating this from zero to d over sine theta, which is equal to L. Um, so we integrate like this, and we end up with our fw is equal to that. I, on the, on the my final, I didn't do uh, d minus y sine theta, I just did um, integrating d, which was wrong. So now we wanna set the moments equal to each other. So we have f gate times L, which is where it's gonna be acting at, is equal to the resultant um, y times fr. Um, since fr is acting on it, this y also needs to be included in integration. It's not just acting at one point. So we have, um, so we're gonna integrate this. So we have y times what our df was, which is rho g times our hy, w dy, which is our da from zero to d over sine theta again. We pull that out, um, go through the whole integration, and we have our f gate l is equal to y r f r. This was found above to be that divided by L and we find our F gate is equal to that. That was t uh, the final exam, problem one.
This is the final exam, problem two, Bernoulli's equation. So if we want to find a scaling law for the area for this free jet, AZ, in terms of other parameters. And we want to solve for the variation of the cross-sectional area of the jet after the water leaves the pipe. So how does the area change as it drops from the pipe? So first, we want to use Buckingham's theorem again. So we have our um, physical variables here, fundamental units here. We have six physical variables. Minus three is three pi groups. I didn't include PATM. That was my mistake on the final. Um, that messed up Buckingham's theorem, which carried through the rest of it. Um, so we have our pi one, which is AZ over A naught. That's the easy one. Our pi two is PATM to the zero, so that's dimensionless. And then our pi three um, is down here. Is um, I just did guess and check. So we have our V naught squared, Z to the negative one, G to the negative one. You can see here that all the units would cancel. And so that's our third group. Um, since pi two is PATM to the zero, our pi one by the corollary is a function of pi two, pi three, but that just drops to nothing. So it's really just a function of pi three. So our az over a naught is equal to a function of v naught squared over gz, which is what we found to be down here. So then our az is equal to that. So that's our scaling law for the area in terms of other parameters. So now we have to solve for the variation of the cross-sectional area using Bernoulli's equation. So we have to make our assumptions. So we assume steady state, incompressible, and viscid fluid, and the equation is constant, constant along streamline. This is our streamline. This is where our datum is for Z. Um, this is V naught. This is P ATM. Since it's open, this is also going to be P ATM here. So we have this for our Bernoulli's equation. We um, start from here and we end here at some arbitrary Z. So this is going to be dropped to zero since it's at the what we set for zero for Z. These PATMs are going to drop, so we start with conservation of mass. V naught A naught is equal to U Z times A Z, wherever that Z is. So our U Z is always going to be equal to that. You can move these around, drop the rows, plug in um, this for U Z like this, and then solve for our A Z like that, and that's the scaling law for at any time Z what the area is going to be there. And that was the final exam question two. This is the final exam, question three, on Reynolds Transport Theorem, Mass, and Linear Momentum. So we have this wave traveling at VW, V1, V2, row one, row two. And we want to find P1 minus P2 in terms of M dot, AC, it's a constant area, V1 and V2. So I didn't do this, and that's where I messed up. Um, v in is, um, it's not just V1 or V2, it's V1 minus VW, because it's moving. And um, V out is V2 minus VW as well. Um, this was something that I, I didn't recognize and that carried through all my mistakes. Um, but so, um, and then in the future for the, um, part B, you also have to figure out when it's traveling at, um, the speed of sound C. So, um, so we start with our linear momentum equation. It's at steady state. The control volume isn't changing. So that's zero. Um, so then we have, uh, the forces over here, M dot in is equal to M dot out. So. Sorry, before that, we did uh, mass conservation two up here, and that is equal to all the m dot, but we're given m dot, it's constant. So then down here, this is equal to m dot, so we just have m dot in, m dot out. The n for this way is negative, the n for the other one is positive, so that's v in and v out is equal to the sum of the forces. For the sum of the forces, we have p1, a1 acting this way, p2, a2 acting this way. We sub in our v in and v outs, these terms would cancel. And then we carry it through, our AC is over there. Um, in the solutions, um, A1 is equal to A2 is equal to AC2. That's why I replaced it with AC. Um, in the solutions, they didn't have M dot. M dot is equal to row one V1 AC or row two V2 AC. Um, but, uh, so they didn't have that. Either one I think is fine uh, because they said that you could have M dot in the directions. Uh, so that was part A. Part B was for the speed of sound. Um, to verify that the speed of sound is equal to this over here. So the speed of sound is C. So if it's moving at the speed of sound of C, then your V in would be V1 minus C, and your V out would be V2 minus C. And then these were also given, um, this was given in the problem that uh, P out is equal to rho, rho out is equal to rho, and then rho, rho in is equal to rho plot plus D rho. So we use mass conservation first, um, AC, um, row in, V in, row out, V out. Um, we didn't replace M dot there. Um, this is negative because it's a negative N hat. That's a positive N hat. Um, this V was just given in the problem as DV. 
um, and this, uh, the V2 was zero, so that's why that's zero minus C, and that's DV minus C. Um, and this is just row for row two. Um, so then we carry that through and we get DV is equal to this. We're assuming that row is much greater than D row, so D row drops to zero, and we're less with DV is about that. Next, we do momentum conservation. So the same thing, zero, steady, not changing, drop it. Is equal to the sum of the forces, so we have P1, A1, P2, A2. This was given in the problem, P2 is equal to P, P1 is equal to P plus DP. This is M dot, so we have this, like this, and we are left with, um, so we have you know the same thing as before, our V in and V out, M dot over AC times this is equal to DP. This is equal to this. Um, we drop it out, and we end up with our another equation for DV is equal to DP over rho C. So then we have from mass dv is equal to the, from momentum dv. We set these equal to each other. This was after our assumption. And then we end up with c is equal to dp over d rho, which is what they asked us to prove in the problem. And that was final exam question three. Reynolds transport theorem, mass, and linear momentum. This is question four, Reynolds transport theorem, angular momentum. So we have a lawn sprinkler type thing. Um, it's at an angle, so it can spray in the air. So this is a side view. You can see it's not perpendicular like this. And this is the front view, A, Z. Control volume isn't changing because so that drops. So we just have the sum of the moments, or the sum of the torques is equal to this. Area A of the um, sprinkler heads. So our U is actually gonna be U cosine theta, and our M dot is going to be U A rho. And then our R, which is our radius, which is acting at, is going to be A, little a, um, and big A is going to be our area. And then N is the number of nozzles. So you have to multiply the whole thing times the number of nozzles um, to get the true control surface volume exiting it. So the torques are going to be equal to this. This is just M dot rho times W times DA is just M dot. So then we could sub in. We have our N term here. Uh, we sub in our U cosine theta like this. Um, and, and that is how you end up with your some of the total torques like that to hold the stationary. Um, in my test, I included cosine theta again for the M dot, but you don't need to do that because it's not dependent for M dot. Um, so that's why I lost points. But that was question four on the final. This is question five on the final exam on Reynolds transport theorem and energy. So our A is if N is equal to zero, what is the diameter of the wake zone E? And B is determine the force acting on the windmill in terms of rho, u, d, and the efficiency, n. So here we have a windmill. Uh, it comes in. The d is this big, and it expands to that much. So the volume flow must be constant. So A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2. Um, so we just do the math like that, and we end up like this. Um, and then we also have to think about if it's perfectly efficient, then the kinetic energy, which is equal to this, has to be equal in the first one to the second one. Um, I didn't include the efficiency in mine, and that's where I lost my points from. Um, but I understand now that you have to do that. So we include one minus whatever the efficiency is times the kinetic energy is equal to that. So then our V, which is the speed here, is going to be equal to U times the square root of one minus whatever the efficiency is. So if it's, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Next, we go on to conservation of momentum. Um, to find the force holding it, which is what they asked us for in B. So now we have conservation of momentum here. This drops to zero steady state, and we have this is equal to Fx. Um, we have rho u squared a1 negative x hat, because that's the n. Um, rho v squared a2 x hat is in that direction. We sub in what we found above for our v um, and our e. And then we also um, have to figure out our areas. So uh, for our A2 and um, our A1 was easy, we could just do that. But we can't have E in the final because it wasn't in, in our given um, variables that we can use. So we have to do a bunch of math here to figure out that A2 is equal to this in relation to D. We can plug that in for Fx. And we end up with our final answer of Fx once we pull this out um, and just move these negatives around is equal to this. And that was question five on the final exam. This is question six on the final exam on potential flows and um, stream functions. Um, let's see on potential flows. So the whole thing was just basically, um, I got all these right, 
but uh, you have to use all of these U's and V's and delta size and not gradient size and gradient of potential um, and plug them in here. Um, it, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, you just have to do the dot product of the gradient here. You get zero, the cross products, and then you end up with the um, absolute, the value squared. And since it's a cross product, it's gonna be in the EZ direction. Um, and then here we have the, once again, the gradient squared of their values. You plug in for your D side EX and D side EY. Um, and then these add up. And then same thing for down here. You wanna prove that the gradient is equal to the cross products uh, in the K direction. And when you multiply that out, you end up with it's the same. Um, it was just a matter of proving it and plugging in these equations into here. That's question six on the final. And here is the last question, question seven of the final. It's on the Navier-Stokes equations. Similar to the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, except this is stationary and this one is moving. Um, so we have the Navier-Stokes equations. We want to find the velocity of y when mu is equal to that. Um, find the shear stress on the lower plate, and then also determine the physical limits on alpha. So alpha was given here, and this uh, this was given in the equation. We were also told to neglect gravity, and also uh, dp dx dropped. I didn't know that on the test. So we'll start off with conservation of mass like this for Cartesian coordinates. This drops because it's not changing in v, not changing in w. It's only changing in uh, the y direction, du dx, but that's equal to zero. So v equals w equals zero. Um, so that's changing like that. So then we have our x hat like this. This was also from the hint. Um, so this drops to zero. I didn't know that. Neglect gravity, not changing the trajectory in that direction, not changing that direction. This is zero, so that drops. This is zero, so that drops. Du dx is zero, so that drops. So then we're left with this. Um, so then after that, we're left with this um, over here. So uh, we integrate twice again, just like we've always been doing. We have a is equal to mu du dy. A over mu is equal to du dy. Integrate again we get this. So now we have A and B, and we have our boundary conditions for no-slip boundary conditions. So U of Y equals zero down here, velocity is going to be zero. And then up here, since this plate is moving at, at U, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be moving at speed U. So we plug that in. Uh, for zero, this term drops because ln of one is zero. B is equal to zero. We plug that in down here again. Um, then we use U of H, and we get this for is equal to A. Plug A in again, cancel, we get U of Y is equal to this. So that's our velocity function. Next, we have to figure out the shear stress, but we already had this term in the integration. It's just equal to A, as shown here, here. So now we're just left with this. Um, so then A is just equal to that. So that's a, just a simple plug in. And then last, we're here left with um, what are the limits of alpha um, and uh, negative viscosities uh, violate second law of thermodynamics. So one plus um, alpha has to be greater than zero. So it has to be greater than negative one because um, from A uh, has ln of one plus alpha and that can't be zero uh, or less than zero or zero. Um, so that's how we also get the negative one and that's how you get C. And that was the final exam. Uh, thank you very much for watching.